Greetings. This is the lecture for um, lesson 25 covering Jeremiah part 1. Let's begin with prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, uh, we bow before you now um, as we open up uh, Jeremiah and look at your prophet, look at the difficult times in which he ministered and we pray Lord that you would help us to have an understanding of your great call to uh, your people, to your workers, and an understanding of the promises and the equipping that comes uh, with your call for each one of us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> well, as I was <clears throat> preparing for this lesson, I came across a reference to two uh, famous paintings of the prophet Jeremiah. Now, since I wasn't familiar with them, I did what many of us do today. I googled these uh, paintings on the internet. There was Rembrandt's painting entitled Jeremiah Lamenting the Destruction of Jerusalem. And then the second one was Michelangelo's similar portrayal of the prophet in the Sistine Chapel. Now, I've prov provided images for you in the slides, the accompanying slides for this lecture, for your information. Both portraits show the prophet, deep in despair, head in hands, old and weary. Both, I think, are accurate depictions of what Jeremiah must have looked like late in his ministry. As we've seen this year, the Old Testament prophets had difficult assignments, and Jeremiah uh, may have had the hardest of all. God had called him to minister to the nation of Judah in their final years. He was to warn them of pending disaster, call them to repent and return to the Lord. But then he had to witness all of that judgment, how it happened. In the same way that we handled Isaiah a few weeks ago, we're going to conduct a very brief survey of Jeremiah's book two weeks to cover 50 plus chapters. And then we'll also spend a week on his small book, Lamentations. As hard as our study has been so far, I must warn you, Jeremiah is even harder. From a practical standpoint, this book is not chronological. In fact, I've provided another slide in the deck for you that shows the scattered dating of Jeremiah's writings. Theologians have difficulty finding a clear structure or outline to this book. Instead, the book reads more like an anthology, a collection of prophetic messages mixed with poetry, mixed with personal and national narrative, mixed with object lessons. But even more than that, neither Jeremiah nor his writings lamentations are particularly easy because Jeremiah did not live an easy life. Throughout each of these books, Jeremiah's personal life figures very prominently. In fact, we know more about his personal life and struggles than we do of any other prophet in the scripture. Now, next week we're gonna get into Jeremiah's message, but this week our focus will be on his call from God and we will see how that call played itself out in the waning years of Judah. We'll see his experiences as the prophet engaged the nation with his unpopular message. And we'll see how the Lord supported his prophet in the face of opposition. So our goal this week is to show, uh, show that God calls and fully equips his people to serve him faithfully, regardless of the difficulty. We've talked a lot about the cost of disobedience this year. That's the consequence of sin. But Jeremiah's ministry is going to teach us about the cost of obedience, the suffering that we will experience as we publicly identify with our Lord and present his message to the world. It is his process of sanctification for his servants. Now, I've organized this lecture into two parts. First, Jeremiah's call from God, that's chapter one. And in this chapter, we're gonna learn that a sense of inadequacy is a normal response to God's call. But along with God's call, he provides everything that we need 
to accomplish his work. And then we're going to look at how Je Jeremiah's ministry, um, uh, you know, uh, proceeded uh, before the nation. That's chapters lo loosely going through the events from 34, chapter 34 to 45. Representing God to the world is a privilege, but it is a privilege that often kind of comes with a great cost. Through that cost, through that pain, God is sanctifying us even as we are serving him. And so if you would turn to Jeremiah chapter 1. You know, it's for here in these opening lines that, that we learn uh, much about his family background. Jeremiah was a Levite. His father, Hilkiah, was a priest. Some of you may remember uh, previously from 2 Kings that a high priest, or 2 Chronicles, excuse me, the high priest who discovered the book of the law during Josiah's reign was named Hilkiah. So some wonder whether Jeremiah was the son of the high priest. Maybe, but, but probably not. Hilkiah was a very common name. Uh, to, just to give you an idea, there are at least five different Old Testament references to priests named Hilkiah. Jeremiah's hometown was Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin, just three miles from Jerusalem. Anathoth was one of the priestly cities that had been allocated to the Levites in Joshua's day. As a Levite, Jeremiah was destined to be a priest, but his call from God superseded his duties of heritage or any other plans that Jeremiah might have had. You might wonder what the difference was between those Old Testament priests and those Old Testament prophets. Well, the priests were born into their positions. They were the keepers of the law. They were the teachers of the law to the people. They conducted the outward religious practices, all the ceremonies. Priests rarely preached to the crowds. More often, they ministered to individuals. The priests were supported by the sacrifice, sacrifices and the offerings of the people. And the priests had authority by their very heritage and by the, the, by the law of God. As we've seen this year, the prophets were individually called by God. They could come from any tribe in the nation. They came from various backgrounds. The prophets dealt with the attitude of the heart. They spoke to the masses. They, they often pointed out the sins of the nation, and they called the people to return to the Lord in repentance. Prophets had to earn their own way. Prophets had to prove their calling. And because their message was often unpopular, their esteem among the people uh, was very low. It came, during their lifetimes, they were often despised. It was only after they were long gone that they received honor. And this was especially true for Jeremiah. Jeremiah's ministry was a long one, maybe as long as Isaiah's. He was called to service in the 13th year of Josiah's reign, and he served until Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians in 586 BC. That was 41 years. But his service actually continued for some years after that. It's not clear how the Lord always communicated with his different prophets by visions or dreams or even audible voices. We're never sure. But, but the details of Jeremiah's call are very instructive. We read those beginning in chapter 1, verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God knew Jeremiah. The, the Hebrew word translated as knew there in verse 4 is not just intellectual knowledge. That word is normally used for an intimate relationship, like that experienced by a husband and wife. It conveys the idea of being chosen. God not only chose Jeremiah, but he also made him. God was his creator, having formed him in his mother's womb. In fact, it should be noted, this verse uh, is the one used by many Christians as a spiritual basis for opposing abortion. God's choosing of Jeremiah 
for it was for a holy purpose. He was set apart, appointed as a prophet to the nations. And his words applied specifically to Judah, but they had also had an application to the surrounding nations as well as to believers, readers of God's word all the way down to us. I think that we can all relate to Jeremiah's response to God's call. He doubted himself. Verse 6, Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. In Jeremiah's mind, he lacked eloquence needed to, to speak publicly. He lacked the experience. And this is a common reaction by people when asked to serve. I've often heard people, men say, here as we've tried to get leaders in BSF, I'm not ready. Maybe next year. Now, if that is our outlook, we'll never be ready to serve. And the Lord shows that such a response is wrong. In verses 7 to 10, he shows three ways in which Jeremiah was wrong in his response. First of all, he played the authority card. He said, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. When God is calling us to a specific service, we don't have the option to say no. Jeremiah did not have a choice of who to preach to or nor the content of his message. And he did not have to be an eloquent or elder statesman. His job was simply to be an obedient messenger. The apostle Paul makes the same claim in 1 Corinthians 1. He claimed no eloquence when preaching the gospel to the Corinthians. He merely preached the cross of Jesus Christ and it was God who provided the power behind his message. And then the second point that the Lord makes is that he promised to protect his prophet. He says, do not be afraid of them for I am with you and will rescue you. As young as Jeremiah was, he was still aware of the state of the nation. He knew he would be attacked and possibly killed but God promised to rescue him. And then the third point God makes is that he showed Jeremiah the very source of his message. And in this particular call, this must have actually been a vision to Jeremiah because the Lord reached out his hand and touched him on his mouth. He said, I have put my words in your mouth. Jeremiah need not worry. God would provide the very words. And the general content of Jeremiah's message was twofold. His would be a message of both judgment and blessing. He would uproot and tear down, that's judgment, and plant, blessing. He would destroy and overthrow, judgment, and build up, blessing. And to confirm his call, the Lord gave Jeremiah two visions. In the first, Jeremiah saw an almond tree. The Hebrew word for almond uh, means to watch or to be awake. So in a play on words, the Lord told Jeremiah he would be watching to see his word fulfilled. You see, God doesn't just speak about the future and then turn his back on the world and hope it all turns out. No, he is actively engaged ensuring Every detail is accomplished. And then the second confirming vision was of a pot boiling over and tilting toward Judah from the north. The Lord was going to bring disaster upon the nations. While Babylon is east of Palestine, invading armies had to follow the trade routes up the Euphrates River and then approach from the north. Their kings would ultimately set up their thrones in Jerusalem's entrance gates, meaning the city would fall because of their idolatry. When the task explained, uh, with the task explained, God charged his prophet to engage. He said, get yourself ready, stand up and say to them, whatever I command you. And that leads me to the first principle. And that is that God's call to service comes with a promise of his provision. God's call to Jeremiah is directly applicable to us. With, com 
Well, what a comfort it is that God loved us before we were ever born. God exists outside of time. In fact, he created time. He loved us before time. He will never cease to love us in time and will love us when time is no more. And what is equally amazing is that he has called us into our roles uh, way back in eternity past. So when we are called by the Lord and we feel inadequate for the task, we are wrong. Our reasons for inadequacy may be uh, real, but they are invalid. That is because human ability cannot accomplish the work of God. God works through us. Our culture places great value on feelings, but when it comes to serving the Lord, our feelings don't, are, they're not important. God's commands and promises are what are important. This principle resonates with me and my experiences. When I was first called <clears throat> to be a substitute teaching leader of this class, and then later as the teaching leader, I felt exactly the same way as Jeremiah. And yet, even at those points, I understood that I didn't have a choice. But God provided me all along the way with everything that I needed, his spirit to guide me, his word, the people around me, and much, much more. And as demanding as the role has been, it, it has never been a burden. And that's because God has been with me all the way. From a personal perspective, I was and am today inadequate for the job but I have come to know inadequacy as a prerequisite to service to God. We are about spiritual work, and that requires the Holy Spirit's leading. And so I want to ask you, how have you responded to God's call to service? Or have you even recognized his call? You see, when the sovereign God of the universe calls to us, he expects us to respond positively, and he provides everything we need to do so. Now, as we jump to chapter 34, 36, in that section there, we enter a part of Jeremiah's writings that are a historical narrative from Jeremiah's perspective. And we also jump some 20 years ahead from God's initial call to Jeremiah. Now, since we've covered this part of Judah's history two months ago, let me remind you of what happened. Jeremiah's service began in the middle of Josiah's reign, and his reign was a period of great spiritual renewal. He had restored the temple and the priesthood. He led the people in their recommitment to their covenant with God. But that covenant by the people was super, superficial. As soon as Josiah died, he was succeeded by a series of kings who were unworthy of their calling. The nation quickly reverted back into their idolatrous ways. At the time, Jehoiakim was king. He had been installed, by, uh, uh, installed as king by the Egyptian pharaoh Necho. For just a few years, Judah was under the thumb of Egypt, but even then was under the, the, uh, the increasing pressure from the Babylonian Empire. The Lord commanded Jeremiah to document all of his prophecies on scrolls. And the purpose of recording these prophecies was to read them to the people. Perhaps they would respond and repent. So Jeremiah summoned his scribe, a man named Barak, who dutifully wrote down all that Jeremiah dictated. Barak then went to the temple and read all the prophecies to the assembled people. And he did this because Jeremiah had previously been excluded from the temple courts. When the temple officials heard what Barak was reading, they took the scrolls. They ordered Barak and Jeremiah to go into hiding, and then they took the scrolls to King Jehoiakim. Now it was winter, and the king was sitting beside his fire pot for warmth. And, he, and as he sat there and listened to the reading of the scrolls, as each section was completed, the king took out a knife and cut uh, the, that portion of the scroll off and 
burned it in the fire pot until all of it was gone. Now you remember back when King Josiah rediscovered the book of the law, he responded to the reading with fear and trembling. He tore his robes, but not so his son Jehoiakim. He showed no fear, no repentance. Instead, he searched in vain to arrest Jeremiah. Here we get a glimpse into how God's word comes about. The Lord had provided his prophet with visions and messages, but Jeremiah dictated those messages in his own words. And this is what Peter writes about concerning God's word. In 2 Peter chapter 1, he writes, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit having inspired, prepared, and preserved his word for people, God expects us to respond. In this case, the religious leaders advised Jeremiah and Barak to hide, but they feared the king more than God. And Jehoiakim, for his part, showed complete disdain for God's word. The king's cost of disobedience would come when the Babylonians forced Judah to surrender. Jehoiakim was taken into exile. And for burning God's word, his descendants would never sit on the throne of David. For Jeremiah, the cost of obedience was witnessing Jerusalem's fall and the first exile of people to Babylon. For those of us who love the Lord, to see people reject him and then suffer the consequences, that's never good. It's never satisfying. It is painful. The Lord then directed Jeremiah to prepare uh, another scroll. A second time, he dictated God's word to Barak and included even more prophecies than before. Presumably, that scroll is what comes down to us today. Jehoiakim was succeeded by his son Jehoiachin, who lasted only a few months. He in turn was replaced by his uncle Zedekiah, who was appointed by Nebuchadnezzar. Zedekiah also proved himself to be a weak and unfaithful king, unable to stand for God or to stand up to the ungodly leaders in his nation. In the final days of the nation, these ungodly leaders falsely accused Jeremiah of siding with the Babylonians. He was beaten and thrown into the dungeon. Other times he was beaten by temple officials and placed in stocks. He was thrown into a cistern and left to die. He was ridiculed and denounced for his faith and his message. He was accused of not seeking the good of the people. As God's prophet, Jeremiah was the only one seeking their good because the ultimate welfare of all people will be found in obedience to the will of God. Let's put this in context. What if the Lord gave one of his, or gave one of us, his prophetic message, calling the people of our nation today to repent and turn back to God? And if not, the Lord was going to use a specific nation, say China, to destroy our country and subjugate our people. How would the leaders respond? How would we respond? And yet, that's exactly what God called Jeremiah to do, to stand before the people virtually alone. All of this was the pain of obedience. Jeremiah had to suffer to stand for the Holy Lord. Multiple times, King Zedekiah approached the prophet, asking him for prayer, asking him to gain, to get a word from the Lord. But tragically, the king only sought God's deliverance from the Babylonians. He never sought God himself, nor for his people. Jeremiah's counsel was consistent. Repent and submit to the will of God. You see, even at that late stage, submission to God was ultimately surrendered to the Babylonians. They were God's instrument of judgment. But submission 
would have at least minimized their pain. And then finally, in chapter 39, Jeremiah endured the greatest nightmare, the final fall of Jerusalem. And what's shocking about it all is that the Babylonians actually treated Jeremiah far better than his own people. The Lord was true to his word in protecting his prophet because he had trusted in the Lord. The Babylonians offered Jeremiah a choice. He could go to Babylon with the exiles, with the promise that he would be taken care of, or he was welcome to stay behind in Judah. Offered comfort in Babylon, Jeremiah chose to stay with his people. God's prophet still had a heart for God's people, even in their rebellion. In our leaders meeting Sunday morning, one of our leaders asked the question, how, how do you discern between true prophets and false prophets? Well, there are a number of criteria, but the most obvious one in the Old Testament was that the prophets from God were, were to be correct in their predictions 100% of the time. In the waning days of Judah, the false prophets claimed that the Lord would never let Jerusalem fall. He would always preserve the place where his temple stood. You see, they pointed back to God's deliverance of Jerusalem under Hezekiah, uh, defeating the Assyrians. Well, the, the, the fail, they failed to account for Isaiah's prophecy warning of Babylon 100 years earlier. They failed to account for God's patience and his judgment and his forbearance. Jeremiah suffered. Repeatedly, the people ignored his warnings and advice. Even after Jerusalem fell, Jeremiah encouraged the remaining people to stay in the land. He told them God would prosper them and protect them. But just as the kings had sought his prayers and guidance, only to refuse to obey what he said, these people also called him a liar and a deceiver. And in a direct repudiation of his warnings, they, they left Judah for Egypt and forced Jeremiah to come along. And what happened to them? They did not prosper and they died violent deaths in that foreign land. The pain of obedience for Jeremiah was felt in, again, having his people um, that he loved reject his advice. Throughout his ministry, Jeremiah experienced more pain and agony than many of us can imagine. But still, he was undeterred. He faithfully continued preaching the word of the Lord until there were no more words left to say. But the power of God's protecting presence was with him. Jeremiah successfully fulfilled God's costly call for his life. How he grew and was transformed from that young man back in chapter 1, he didn't know how to speak and was inexperienced. And yet by the power of God's protecting presence, he persevered to the end. He who began a good work in Jeremiah carried it all the way to completion. Jeremiah's life exemplifies the sanctifying work of God that he accomplishes in the lives of his people. Your life and mine. God can and will use our circumstances, even the painful ones, especially the painful ones, to shape and mold and purify our characters and accomplish his greater purposes. And so the final principle is that God's called messengers value his truth over their comfort. Jeremiah's life is a reminder that while following the Lord is our highest privilege, it often comes with a great cost. We may not experience the extent of suffering that Jeremiah did, but some Christians have and still do today. He was beaten, humiliated, in and out of prison. The Babylonians were more gracious to him than his own people. His motives were severely challenged, accused of conspiring with the enemy. Today, our culture values tolerance over the truth. It seems to me that we Christians will be increasingly viewed as problematic, just as Jeremiah was. Jesus taught his disciples that same truth in the upper room. Just as God chose Jeremiah before the beginning of time, Jesus 
says he has chosen us. The world hates Christ and they will hate us. The world does not obey his teachings, nor will they obey ours when we present the truth of the gospel. To the extent that we are obedient to his calling, we too will experience pain. But with that pain, he will be with us in our suffering. He will be using that pain to make us more like his dear son, Jesus Christ. So I ask you, how have you experienced pain through obedience to Christ? I don't expect any of us to have been thrown into stocks or even a cistern, but that cost may, be, may come in the form of a rejection of the gospel message or even in ridicule for our faith. If that is true for you, be encouraged, for that is how they treated the prophets. That is how they treated our Lord. You see, God is with us, and he is using our suffering for our good and his glory. And with that, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of your son, your uh, prophet Jeremiah. We thank you for your calling to him and the promises that you gave him, knowing that we have similar callings and promises. Heavenly Father, I pray that just as you were faithful to your prophet throughout his life, I pray that you would show yourself real to each one of us and faithful to us, carrying us all the way through. And I pray that each one of us will be found faithful, persevering to the very end and fulfilling our calling from you. We pray this in the name of Jesus and for the sake of his church. Amen.